and welcome. This is Wednesday, September 2nd, 2020. This is the Education Committee in the Vermont House of Representatives. And we're delighted uh, this afternoon to welcome Congressman Peter Welch, who's going to talk to us today about uh, what's happening at, in Congress related to schools in this uh, COVID period. So uh, welcome Congressman Welch. Thank you for joining us today. Um, well, I want to thank you very much. Um, a couple things. First of all, uh, Madam Chair, I really appreciate you uh, convening your committee, along with your Vice Chair, uh, Mr. Coopley. It's very good to see you and uh, your nice colleague. Nice to see you, Peter. Yeah, it, it, it really is. I mean, we are all in this together as legislators trying to figure out how to make our way from uh, where we are to where we need to be. Um, and my goal uh, today is, is two things. One, in, in all candor, uh, is to focus attention on the enormous challenge that Vermont has and where you have significant responsibility about how safely to get our kids back to school. Uh, you know, we know that uh, the virus has got its own power and we can't just bull our way through it. Uh, we have to take the appropriate health care guidance about social distancing. But as your committee knows, probably uh, more acutely than anyone else, it's really important that our kids be back at school. That's really, really important. And, but they have, that has to be done safely. And working that out is very, very challenging. So I wanna talk a little bit about that and what I see as the federal role um, and uh, acknowledge what I think is the state role. And then secondly, to give you an overall, uh, just a, a report on where things stand uh, in Washington. Um, first of all, on the question of opening schools, you all have been to many of our local schools and I have as well, most recently up to uh, the school in Gilman uh, in the school in Lunenburg. And the resources in all of our schools vary enormously. The size of the class, the HVAC systems, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the number of students. Every single one of these schools in order for it to open safely requires an immense focused effort on the part of our local school leaders to answer very practical challenges and I think we've got to all give real respect to that challenge that our school boards, our teachers, our principals, uh, and our parents uh, face. And in talking to parents, the, the, what I've been told by many of our educators, but also my own experience, is like a third of the parents are really nervous about the healthcare risk of kids going back to school, understandably. A third are desperate if the kids don't go back to school because kids need school, but parents need school. You know, that's a time parent and some parents are not able to work if their kids can't go back to school. And of course, a lot of other kids uh, or other parents just they don't know and hope that uh, the leadership, your committee uh, and state leaders will figure it out. So my view on this is that we have to approach this with an objective where we're going to do every single thing we can to make it as safe as possible so that there is a realistic option for kids safely to return to school. Now, the federal role in this, it's money. It's really money. And the reason I say that is that in order for a school that has bad ventilation to open up, they've got to get good ventilation. That's not in the budget. In order for the schools to safely have the kids, there's got to be adequate personal protective gear. In order for the schools to function without this being an enormous burden on the local property taxpayer, we're going to need some additional resources for the instruction, for mental health counseling, for also some of the technology that may be 
helpful uh, in making it possible uh, on a flexible schedule for schools to open. Congress initially responded to the virus back in March in a bold way with bipartisan support. And under that initial legislation, the CARES Act, it was about $4.6 billion that came to Vermont. And some of that was for that $1,200 check that was helpful, but it doesn't sustain things at this point. That's in the rear view mirror now. It helped, but it's not helping now. Some of it was extended unemployment. And that was that $600 that's become controversial and has now expired. That was helpful, but that's in the rear view mirror. Some of it was the uh, payroll protection plan that was so, was so important to so many of the businesses and the communities that you represent. And that's still having some effect, but much of that is in the rear view mirror as well. And of course, we had the coronavirus relief fund uh, that was about $1.25 billion uh, that, had, that, that could be used for COVID related expenses, including K through 12 and some higher education. And I know your committee uh, was involved in using $6 million of that to help upgrade uh, the HVAC systems in our schools, uh, although our superintendents tell us that we probably need two or three times that amount. So that kept us afloat. And, you know, when I talk to some businesses, they say if they didn't have PPP, they, they, would, they just wouldn't have survived. Uh, when I talk to Vermonters who got that $1,200 check or that, uh, that some of the, uh, uh, it was really made a difference. And a lot of folks, <clears throat> by the way, who in the past, you know, a lot of Vermonters are self-employed or they're independent contractors. Under prior law, they would not have been eligible for any unemployment at all. So that $600, which does have some controversial elements to it, for those folks, it was literally uh, that in, versus eviction uh, in paying the rent. So all of that has helped us stabilize and help stabilize finances. Um, and of course, the healthcare response in this state as a result of the leadership from Montpelier, the governor's office, the legislature, and I think cooperation and trust among citizens we have the lowest COVID infection rate in the country. And there's a lot of credit to be shared for that. But, and this is, I'm gonna make a statement about my deep affection for the Vermont General Assembly. There's trust there that where I am doesn't exist at the level it does uh, in Montpelier. And I say that not just as a sentimental observation, but I actually think trust is so, under assault now, but so necessary to the successful uh, capacity of a community to overcome a challenge. So I, I just wanna pay a tribute to your committee and its bipartisanship and focus on how do we help the kids. Where we're at now is that that bipartisan cooperation uh, that was so wonderful to see Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi negotiate in about a week that a uh, $2.2 trillion CARES package. Uh, unfortunately, that's in the rear view mirror as well. And where we stand now is that the House has passed, you know, let me just pause for a minute. That was, what we did was useful, it was important, it's helping Vermont, uh, but it's not time to tap on the brakes because the virus is not yet contained. We've gotta be incredibly vigilant. And my view is that and my role in Washington, I'm an advocate that we should err on the side of doing too much too soon rather than too little too late. And too much too soon means we do pass the HEROES Act. It was passed in the House um, 100 days ago. And that, as you know, is about a $3 trillion package that would bring well, over $3 billion to Vermont. And it would do two things that are really important. Number one, that money that comes to Vermont and to our local municipalities would come with great flexibility. Number two, it would provide flexibility for the money that came in the uh, CARES package. 
as you remember in the CARES package, there's real restrictions on what the money can be spent on and when it has to be spent by. So it handcuffs you. And my operating premise is that my role as your federal representative is to get the resources back to you. Your role is to make those tough decisions on how to allocate them to best protect Vermonters. So I am a very strong advocate of flexibility, both with any new money that may come if we can work out the deal with Senator McConnell in the Senate, but also to give you flexibility with the money that's already here and where your hands are tied. I know there's a great deal of interest, for instance, in uh, funding the Vermont State Colleges uh, to help them through this situation they're in, but you need flexibility in order to be able to make that decision. My view, that's a very wise decision for Vermont, so I hope we can get you that flexibility. Uh, so if in, in the legislation that we passed 100 days ago, that is we in the House, there was a hundred billion dollars that would be available to help local school districts with reopening. And I'll tell you about the money in there, it's all important for small business, for individuals, unemployment. But I really believe getting our kids back to school, as long as we can do it safely, is really important. It's important for them, it's important for their parents, uh, and it's important for their well-being. But that can't easily be done under the best of circumstances, but we do need resources that are available if we can get an agreement with the Senate to get some money back, in this case to Montpelier, for you to help get it out to our local school districts. One other piece of legislation that we passed that is, is stalled in the Senate is an infrastructure bill uh, that has $100 billion for broadband. And how many of you have been hearing from your constituents about how essential that is? I mean, we're not talking about surfing the net. We're talking about going to school. We're not talking about doing homework. We're talking about going to school. We're not talking about surfing the net for parents. We're talking about them working at home. Um, the uh, So that is really, really important. And by the way, the healthcare appointments have been really enhanced by uh, broadband. So we've got to get that. And I know, I know you know that. And again, I think my job is to try to get resources back here so you can do the hard work of implementation. <clears throat> but there's also in that legislation, uh, the infrastructure bill, $130 billion that would be available for infrastructure improvement of our schools retrofitting everything from the HVAC systems to the boiler systems uh, uh, to falling apart systems. And I mentioned to you earlier that I went up to uh, Gilman and Lunenburg and the people up there, they are, they're, they're tough, they're resilient, they care about uh, uh, their kids enormously. But in Gilman, of course, uh, they had a factory closing uh, it's years ago and uh, it's uh, tough with jobs and property taxes are high, they need some help. They're working hard and they've got these kids uh, in the school uh, in Gilman where there's like water in the basement and it was built on a swamp and somehow, some way they managed to cobble it together. But that's not sustainable in the long run. And it really isn't within the capacity of many of our taxpayers to be able to pay all of these bills. So I believe part of infrastructure has to be helping communities uh, revitalize their schools. I don't have any um, optimism that that'll get passed at this point, uh, but what we are doing is laying a foundation for action next year uh, when we return in, in January. Uh, so I wanted to report that to you because I know that you're among the pressures that you face is how to help your schools uh, that each of you cherish. You know, that part of being a state representative is the schools in your communities that in, in you see the kids, you see the parents, you see the teachers, and you see how they cobble things together. Well, we've got to get some help so they can upgrade those schools. Um, so step back here a minute. 
will we get uh, the Heroes Act or some version of it passed? Uh, I, I'm discouraged about it right now. You know, the House passed it 100 days ago. And the provisions that are in it, they're expensive. There's no question about it. But this is a once in a 100 year event that you are contending with, that your school boards are contending with. And the old rules, you know, I'm a pay as you go guy and we're pretty frugal here in Vermont. But my view is that in view of this emergency, the federal government is the only entity that has the fiscal flexibility and the fiscal capacity to help you help the people you represent. So it's a matter of great urgency, I think, for us to pass it. It's caught up now in politics and we've got the presidential campaign under the, underway and that makes it tougher. But when I talk to my Republican colleagues and I tell them about going to the school in Gilman in Lunenburg, they talk to me about rural communities they represent and it's the identical problem. When I talk to them about the challenges that their schools have for reopening, they want them to reopen, but they, those schools need PPP just like we do. Uh, they need some extra uh, help for broadband, just like we do. They need extra help uh, for some technology uh, to uh, facilitate uh, teaching, just like we do. So this legislation that is on the table by and large has universal application that it doesn't matter if you're a kid who's in a red district or a blue district, you need to be in a safe school. So that's the aspect of this where I continue to have some optimism because the things that we need here in Vermont, you know, Kate, you need it in your district for your kids and Larry, you need it in your district for your kids. It just doesn't matter what party label you have. And the challenge that we have in Washington is that we don't have that level of cooperation uh, that you enjoy uh, by your hard work in, in uh, Montpelier. But uh, the need here is universal. Every single one of our kids in every part of the country deserves to have a fair shot at getting the education to move ahead in this world. So I'm gonna keep at it, but there are political forces here now with the presidential race uh, that uh, are a factor and beyond your control or mine. But uh, I wanna end by, again, where I started, thanking you for your work. You know, I'm pretty proud to represent Vermont where because of what you've done, you in the large sense uh, and your fellow citizens too, we've got a low infection rate. And I also am very appreciative of how you've made good use, I think, of the money that did come from the CARES package, making hard decisions about allocating those resources to best help Vermonters get through this. Uh, but there's more that we need to do. And I go back to the principle that the federal government is the one that has the fiscal capacity to get aid back to Montpelier. And that then the decisions, the hard decisions about how to allocate it should be made between the governor and the legislature. And then the hard work of act actual implementation has to be done in the case of education at the school level. Um, so uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, visit with you today and, and try to in, in, in focus on this enormous challenge that we have here in Vermont to safely open up our schools so our kids can get the education they need and be safe while they're getting it. Thanks, Thank Kate. Thank you so much. I, we only have about 10 minutes for questions and I know this is gonna be really hard for us. So if we have questions, let's try to keep them, our comments, let's keep them focused because this is a, a rare opportunity that we have the Congressman here and uh, Representative Dylan Jean Batista. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Congressman Welch, for being here. We, we certainly appreciate all you do and how present you are, in, both in each of our communities, but also at the State House in Montpelier. So thank you for being such a resource. Um, and thank you also for focusing on infrastructure. I know that's a concern of this committee and that you've probably heard from some of us about the need to rebuild our schools. So excited to learn what's possible there in the future. 
Um, I do want to share uh, one piece of feedback I got from my school district that I assume other districts are contending with. And this is the ability to share resources uh, for providing meals to students. So currently we are providing free meals. And I understand that the USDA just extended uh, flexibility for those dollars through December 31st. But certainly anything you can do and others to uh, ensure that there is flexibility going further uh, so that we can provide nutritional meals to our students would be welcome. So thank you for your advocacy. Just yeah. want to share that feedback. And we're grateful to have you in our corner. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dylan. And those meals have been a lifesaver. And isn't it amazing how creative our local school boards were? You know, they, they, they put the buses back out on the route to deliver meals. And I've been to a, a couple of the places just down in Bellows Falls a while ago where they were in there making all the meals. People were picking them up there and they were delivering them. And by the way, people are hungry. So this is not abstract. This is really, really critical. So thanks, Dylan. Um. One of the, the, first of all, I want to thank your, you and your office, you and you, your office and, and you and I have been in conversation about infrastructure for some time. Um, and we had actually been working on uh, getting an inventory of our, of our school right. uh, infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, and then we ran into this thing called a global pandemic and, and had, to, had to stop that. And it was our hope to be able to be better prepared should federal funds come forward. So I, I hope that if not this year, next year, um, about 130 billion um, uh -huh. can uh, become available. I see Casey Toof, Representative Toof. Yeah, thank you. I just want to thank you again, uh, Congressman, for coming in today. Um, the committee knows this, but I just wanted to share my story. I'm not only a, a, a representative, but I also have a five-year-old that started kindergarten next week. So um, I'm trying to watch this the, as close as I can. We're excited to get him in school, but we understand how um, the safety precautions uh, that, that we have to put in place. So it's really hard on, on families in Vermont, but we are all working on this together. And I think that you hit the nail on the head when you said um, it's all about working together. I think this legislative body has done a really good job working with the administration um, as well as the leadership. So I really want to uh, uh, let you know that we are doing everything we can together to, uh, to do what's right for the people of Vermont. So thank you for coming in. Well, Casey, good luck to you, you know, the five-year-old. Um, I know you, he's a little young, so you haven't had to be doing all the homeschooling, but my hat is off to the parents who are juggling full-time work at home, full-time educating, you know, like a seven-year-old and a 10-year-old. Um, that, that is hard. And, and I, I'll, I'll add that I have a four-year-old as well. And um, <laughs> so we're, we're working on all that together. But, you know, when, when I have meetings here, I have a tough enough time with my broadband to access these yeah. meetings with the video on. So I couldn't imagine what it's going to be like when I have a kid trying to access it as well. So anything that, uh, you know, any improvements that we look at in broadband capabilities yeah. is really important. Yeah. Thank you. Kathleen James. Yeah, thanks, Congressman, for being here. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, so it sounds like the uh, odds of getting the HEROES Act passed anytime soon are, are dim. Um, what about the thought of, uh, of getting any greater flexibility around how we can spend CARES Act money, um, specifically maybe to replace lost revenues? Is there any chance well, of that, or is that a lost cause as well? Yeah, I, you know. Um, Kathleen, I think there's a chance that we will get some version of the CARES or uh, the HEROES Act passed. Okay, the 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 opposition on the on uh, from the president appears to be on state and local aid, uh, which I think is unfortunate because we know that if uh, we impose on the state, if we don't give the states help, it's a brutal hit on your revenues. You've been getting briefed on that. And it is a huge hit on property taxpayers or the reduction in education and healthcare services and other things. Um, the, the president's objection appears to be that, you know, the way he puts it is to bail out of the of the of the, of, bad, of blue states. And some states have pension problems. I mean, we have our own challenges on that. But I actually think that whatever the pension issues are in a state, that should continue to be the responsibility of the state. The COVID money is to help the states deal with the impact of the COVID uh, virus. So when I talk to a lot of my Republican colleagues, they know and support 
getting aid to the states. So this could change, you know, but the, the one who's in charge here is President Trump because he and the, the Senator McConnell work fairly closely. And my hope is that a lot of my Republican colleagues who are facing the same challenges you are on your committee, uh, your counterparts in uh, various states are making the case to my colleagues and, and maybe we can reach a compromise. That's one of the disputes. The other is the $600 uh, issue and there's room for compromise on that as well. And on flexibility, you know, it's, it's generally been um, a, a Republican point of view as well as Democratic point of view that local decision-making is probably better uh, because you're closer to the problem. So I see that as something where uh, in the past, I found myself on the same page with a lot of my Republican colleagues. All of that is to say that this could change fairly quickly, but it's gonna be the way we are right now, uh, it's really gonna be up to President Trump. And then if he makes an offer, uh, will we be willing to compromise? And the answer to that is yes, because we've got to get back to the state some of the revenues that they need to address this problem and help the kids. So I, I haven't given up hope at all on either the flexibility or some, some aid. Thanks. Thank you. We have a couple more minutes. I guess one thing that I would say is um, when the CARES Act came out, there were funds to be available to schools through the ESSER funds as we call them. Um, and they were to be tied to Title I then Secretary DeVos came in and said, uh, don't forget the independent schools. So we got a little bit tangled up in the use of ESSER funds. And then of course there was a court case saying, and I've forgotten it in another state, uh, related to not requiring states to send the funds to the independent schools. So just, uh, I guess, ask you to keep an eye on that. There's it, one of the things that we saw is you wanna see inequity, close schools, it's an absolute, clear guiding line, dividing line as to who's doing well and who isn't um, right so well no you know i'm glad you said that kate because it really is about the children i mean we cannot covid uh pandemic stunt the educational growth and the emotional well-being of our kids we can't we can't do that and nobody knows that better than the members of your committee and you know what? We don't have to. It's tough. It's hard. But I think our local uh, uh, education leaders and our teachers and our parents, you know, we're up to it. But you can't do it if you don't have safety. That's the thing you're not in control of. We can take the steps we need to get safety, but we have to have the resources to do it. And that's why this aid in the HEROES Act, I think is so, so important uh, to help you be successful. Um, I, I have one more question from uh, Representative Austin that would obviously take a very long response. So I'm gonna hope that, that we can keep it a, a, a short response. It's a very large question, but I do wanna give Representative Austin a chance to ask the question. Thank you, um, Congressman. Well, for being here, yeah. you know, your time is limited. Anyway, I'm just wondering, this kind of is a little bit shift in the conversation, but um, can you update me where Congress might be at in the Justice and Policing Act of 2020? The Justice and Policing Act? Yes. Was that the question? Uh, we've passed it in yes. the House. It, we've passed it in the House and the way it works, is Senator McConnell has the authority as the Senate Majority Leader to decide when, whether, and if that legislation will be considered by the Senate. Uh, I'm a strong supporter of it. We had some bipartisan support for it uh, in the House. And uh, I think it's very important for us to pass that, uh, but it's in the Senate and that's gonna be a decision that Senator McConnell is in control of. But thank you for that thank question. You. Thank you. I thank you so very much for taking the time to join us in our little Hollywood Squares room here. Um, well, again, I just want to thank you and I want to thank all our educational leaders. I mean, this is so, so hard. It's always fraught. You know, it, local education, we all know is really important. 
and uh, parents are always really concerned and they're, we're all anxious, including parents about the well-being of our kids. Um, our educational administrators have an immense challenge because they are committed to getting those schools open safely uh, and they have to work with the parents and the teachers to try to make that happen. But it's really important for the federal government to do its part and get back to the, uh, the school districts, the resources that are absolutely essential for the safety um, of the schools as we try to get our kids back uh, to normal. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, thank you, Congressman. A good Best to Margaret. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, tomorrow. Larry. She says hello. Our, our <laughs> former colleague, <laughs> correct? Yes. And with that, we're going to switch to a conversation about how to spend the CRF funds, as well as any changes we need to make to statute uh, for schools <laughs> um, going forward uh, in this, this period. So I'm going to start with um, Mark Perot. Um, and who's going to uh, give us a start uh, on, on um, some recommendations that are coming forward related to use of CRF. I know these folks have been burning the midnight oil, so I appreciate your work in trying to get it organized for us. Okay, so um, good. Woo, here we go. Screen sharing. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm going to just sort of walk you through this sheet. Um, uh, Stop me if you have any questions as we go along. This was done kind of quickly, so um, there may be questions that come up as I go through it. So just to remind you where we were, um, Section A50 of Act 120 that you passed back when you were when we were still in session allocated or appropriated $50 million out of the state's $1.25 billion coronavirus relief fund allocations from the feds. And that appropriation was intended to fund CRF eligible costs for both 2020 and 2021 for school districts. And the $50 million appropriation, I've shown how it was broken out here. So $20 million was made available for uh, reimbursements for school districts with CRF eligible costs. $6.5 million was made available for indoor air quality through Efficiency Vermont. $12 million was made available for the summer school meal program. And the remainder was um, a million and a half to independent schools and a million dollars to for administration um, of the program. Now, since um, the amount of CRF eligible expenditures was completely unknown um, at the time Act 120 passed, um, legislature also um, indicated that it intended to set aside $100 million of the state's remaining CRF allocation to be appropriated when you came back in August and September um, so that districts could be assured that they would be fully reimbursed for any expenditures that they've made that are CRF eligible. So coming up with an estimate for you has been difficult for a bunch of reasons, mostly timing, but applications um, from districts for a share of the $29 million available for district reimbursement um, have to be sent to the um, Agency of Education as of today. However, the agencies indicated that they uh, would not be able to provide a good estimate of the statewide um, total of uh, CRF eligible spending until September 10th or 11th. Um, we'll still be in session then, but it's beyond the time that the House needs to uh, move ahead with this in the restated budget. So in order to come up with an estimate for you, we've, um, my office, the Joint Fiscal Office, has been working with the Superintendents Association to come up with a, um, a, a best estimate that we can come up with at this point of the additional amount on top of the $29 million that you've appropriated that may be necessary in order to assure schools that they're going to get fully reimbursed for all their CRF costs. So the Superintendents Association, and I think Jeff is here to speak to this as well, but um, the VSA surveyed 52 supervisor unions and they obtained, as of this morning, they had 29 SUs reporting estimates of their CRF eligible spending. Um, the average for the district's reporting was about $650 per equalized pupil. Um, all I've done for this estimate is just to scale up that per pupil estimate um, to the state level and that would produce an estimate of a uh, total estimate of about $57 million 
needed to reimburse school districts for CIRF eligible costs. That is about $28 million more than the $29 million that's already been appropriated for this purpose in Act 120. So total amount that's estimated for this purpose would be 57 million, 20, 28 of it's already been appropriated. Um, you have the opportunity now to make a recommendation to the House Appropriations Committee for the additional amount that we're anticipating may be needed. That amount um, to the best we can come up with right now would be an additional $28 million. And any questions at that point before I go on to the next couple of pieces? No? Okay. Um, indoor air quality. Um, there was also this, the, the, the demand for air quality um, we think now is going to, it's likely to exceed the six and a half million dollars that was appropriated um, in the um, quarter one, the first quarter budget. And it looks now based on um, requests that have come in that that appropriation could be short by about eight or nine million dollars. The problem with this one is that um, even though that the, even though there's demand for that money, which could be as high as fifteen million dollars, it's very unlikely that school districts would be able to um, utilize that money and get their expenditures completed by December thirtieth. So rather than a full eight or nine million dollars in addition, we're recommending that um, an additional appropriation of five million dollars will likely be sufficient to cover the costs of. Um, CRF eligible expenditures and by CRF eligible in this case, I mean expenditures that can, can get completed by December 30th. Um, so that brings us up to 20, 29, yeah, an additional 28 plus an additional five bringing us up to about 33 million. Um, a more complicated issue is the summer meals program. Um, in the um, quarter budget, in the $50 million appropriation, um, there was an, in the house version of it, there was no money carved out for the summer schools meal program. So when the bill got over to the Senate in a separate bill, the Senate provided and it ultimately passed the legislature, a provision that said that up to $12 million of that $50 million appropriation could be used for the summer meal program. However, um, rather than having that, that this appropriation run through December 30th, um, this appropriation required that the, the money be spent by the end of August. So that's obviously gone by. Um, AOE's um, indicated that um, of that 12, of the appropriation of up to $12 million, districts were only able to draw down $3 million of that money. So that would leave $9 million sort of orphaned. Um, it, can't be, it can't be used anymore for the summer schools meal program because of the additional constraints that the legislature put in when you um, appropriated this money. However, um, AOE is recommending that up to $4 million um, could be in CRF money could be used um, to assist district in the purchase of um, basically food service equipment, um, supplies and equipment that would be necessary to provide meals to kids. And I think um, Jim will show you a, a draft um, later on um, that, that would incorporate that. But that means that out of that 12, three has already been used. If you decided to do this um, ad additional appropriation for equipment, that would use up 4 million to bring to you 7 million. So there'd be about $5 million left um, from that program that um, is, is unspoken for at this point. So to cut to the chase, um, at the bottom of the sheet you're looking at, I've just um, showed you how we arrived at a recommendation of $32 million in additional CRF appropriations um, that you'd send to the House Appropriations Committee. It starts out with the $28 million that I talked about um, for an additional reimbursement for LEAs. Then there would be the $5 million additional appropriation for um, HVAC indoor air quality um, spending, which would bring us up to 33 million. Then credit the remaining amount of money that's available from the summer meals appropriation. So that's the original 12 minus the three that was used and minus an additional four potentially to use for uh, meal service equipment, which brings you to 28 million. I then calculated a 5% cushion because you know we're, we're only in sep beginning September. Um, it's likely that districts are going to be able to identify additional costs between now and December 30th. So that 5% cushion would be an additional 4 million, which would bring the total up to $32 million. And I know that was really quick, but um, does anybody, anybody have any questions? Let me just pre preface this by saying um, that we asked uh, 
Larry and Peter and I asked JFO uh, to work with the agency and to work with the Superintendents Association um, on a recommendation for us, recognizing that this information is not complete. However, we still need to be making a recommendation to appropriations. So we're making, we're, we're doing kind of the introductory um, recommendation to approach that it will look exactly like this as we saw in June is unlikely. Um, and I realize this is, this is complicated. Um, and I know that our, our committee usually likes to get, go a little bit deeper into this. Um, but basically we're looking at the money that was appropriated. We're looking at what everybody thinks that they're going to need based on the information we have at the moment and trying to find out what that, that difference is and then put it all together in a bill that deals with all CRF funds. So that's pretty easy. We're just very appreciative of the folks that worked on, on this uh, so far. Um, Sarita Austin. Thanks, Mark. Um, I know we covered this and I, I apologize, but I know we set aside $100 million in the spring for educational needs. Just if someone could just review one more time where that money is and can it be used, at, a portion of that, can that be used? Um, can this, this recommendation be used, taken out of those funds? So when, 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 you, when, the, when the legislature broke, when you were last in session, you indicated intent to, res, to reserve $100 million of this money for K through 12. Right. Um, altogether, there's about $198 million available, but in the governor's restated budget, he uses almost all of that money for purposes other than K through 12 education. I can send you a sheet that shows you the breakout if you want, but none of the remaining money was um, appropriated in the governor's restated budget for K through 12 for this purpose. But um, that's the governor's restated budget. You have the opportunity to you know, to weigh in on this, you have to, you know, the money has to be appropriated. So um, this is an attempt to identify the amount of money that you may want to appropriate out of the, out of the money that hasn't been used yet for K through 12 to assure that districts get what they're expecting, which is full reimbursement for any CRF eligible costs. Um, Thank you. Francis, Jeff Francis and Chelsea, um, I wanted to check in with you because you had a, you, you spent a great deal of time on helping to bring this Forward. Hi, this is Jeff. Um, Chelsea's watching. Um, okay. So, as I mentioned yesterday, the role we played was to try to um, advance the pace of information to the Joint Fiscal Office so they could advise you. So, in communications that went to the field from me over the course of the last week or so, we asked school districts when they completed their coronavirus relief fund grant program application for the AOE to advance that data to us so we could give it to the Joint Fiscal Office and specifically Mark for the calculation that he's provided before you. So what I would say is that the recommendation or the information that um, JFO is providing to you to make your recommendation is the best available information that we have at the time. It's reflective of information that has come to us from school districts. I'm in agreement with Chair Webb when she says that we're in a preliminary phase here doing the best we can based on the timeline and the information and um, believe that Mark has characterized the current need um, based on our current knowledge um, at this time we know, like you know, that things will change. We'll continue to monitor it. Um, we're gonna continue to update JFO as we hear more from the school districts, even over the next 24 hours or so. And we'll all hang tough and do the best we can. But at this moment, I think Mark's done a nice job with his characterization. And um, I at least would support the recommendation um, as he's recommended it to you. Secretary French. Something to, to add here. Hi. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's good analysis. The only thing I had a, just from our team, um, 
just want to share with you uh, as of this morning, you know, today's the day when those uh, CRF applications are coming in. As of noon today, uh, we had 17 LEA submit uh, requests and the total amount is 13,000, or excuse me, 13 million, dollars um, I think we can endeavor to provide a similar sort of rough uh, summary for you tomorrow morning or sometime tomorrow. Okay, great. And this will be, this is going to be a work in progress um, as, as we go forward. Sure, absolutely. Um, we do know that we needed to make some language changes, which we will be addressing in a minute. I just wanted to see if there's anybody else that wanted to have a question or wanted to speak to this. I don't think we have our, our um... oh, Kathleen James, excuse me. Thanks. Um, I did have a, a question. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the fiscal reality here. Um, these are the costs that schools are required to spend um, in order to follow the health and safety guidelines and open safely. Correct. So if these um, somebody has to pay these costs. So if if CRF doesn't cover um, these costs, I assume will flow to taxpayers. Yes. Cor correct. These aren't optional. These aren't optional frills. These are these are funds that are going out the door to open our schools safely. Yeah, and you know, to, to the extent that school districts make these expenditures with the understanding that they're going to be reimbursed for it, and they're not, that's going to create, you know, problems in local local budgets. And, Sorry, Mark, and, you cut out from. Oh, okay. Um, lost my train of thought there. I guess the, to the to to the extent that districts make expenditures to reopen that they believe are CRF eligible. If they don't get that money, in other words, if we have to prorate the amount of money they get for their CRF eligible expenditures, that'll leave them with deficits in the, in the individual districts, which will ultimately flow through the education fund and to taxpayers, yes. That's, I just wanted to make sure I was understanding that correctly, thanks. Mm -hmm. Peter Conlon, did you have something? Uh, I will ask, um, I, I sort of took it back because I didn't want to get go down too far, Rebel, but I, I didn't know the secretary was with us. And I guess I'm curious to know um, what the administration's uh, view is on wh why um, the governor's proposal really didn't allocate any more money for CRF needs in public schools. Yeah, I think, you know, we... Uh, you know, the larger theme is it's an estimate and we don't have any other information to suggest that what's been appropriated is insufficient. We also have ESSER funds, uh, you know, on the table as well, and certainly the GEAR Act uh, for CTE. So, you know, if the food service is uh, any indication, um, you know, it's, it's going to be hard to project. And I, you know, I think, as I mentioned, I think yesterday, drawing a distinction between reopening costs versus what are the longer financial impacts, as, as Mark said about HVAC, for example. Um, you know, there's there's going to certainly be longer tail financial impacts from the emergency, but I, the, our thinking was a sufficient uh, appropriation between what was already appropriate in CRF and then plus ESSER would be enough to reopen schools. And that was, you know, it's more generous than what the national model pointed to. Any other questions? Okay, if you could stay in the room, I'm going to invite um, going to invite our ledge council, Jim Demaray, um, to pull up our miscellaneous ed bill, which addresses uh, issues we've talked about before, as well as language changes that we would need that we would like to recommend to, that we would recommend to the Appropriations Committee on, on use of these funds. Okay, uh, so for the record, uh, Jim Damer, as Council, we're looking at draft 3.1 of this bill. Uh, Chair Webb, do you want me to go right to those sections and see our funding or- why, go why don't we start with, I think that's good. And then we can, we can back up and do the others, but since we're on that topic, let's go to the, the, last, the last sections on that. So Phil, if you could go yeah, up. I was to just this. say, if, you're, if people are having trouble seeing this, pull it's on the website <laughs> as well. Right here, actually. Right, uh, right here. Uh, oh, sorry. Go up to section seven. That's one more page, yep. Okay, right here. Okay, we have three new sections, seven, eight, and nine. 
Seven deals with um, supplies and equipment for meals for children. Um, so Act um, 120 appropriated $41 million uh, to AOE uh, for pre-K through 12 schools. And then Act 136 took uh, $12 million of that, uh, $41 million, and made it available for reimbursement for summer meals. Okay. Uh, but not all of the $12 million was used uh, before the end of August. Um, therefore, what this does is it takes $4 million of the remaining $12 million of funding, takes $4 million of that, uh, to uh, uh, allow the purchase of CARES Act eligible supplies and equipment, uh, which would include vehicles, freezers, capital assets, et cetera, that are necessary to provide meals to children using the federal child nutrition programs during COVID-19 state of emergency. So that's what that does. It's basically redirecting money that was directed for meals to uh, supplies and equipment for meals. Any questions on that part so far? Okay. This, this, this was, the access to those funds ended at the end of August. And this is a way of um, using some of those funds that are still food focused. And these, these came from, I believe the, the agency and Sarita, did I see you? That's yeah. Much. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, you just muted yourself. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, there you go. Okay. Sorry. Jim, is this equipment specific to address COVID-19 in terms of the type of equipment that we're asking for, like with you know, shields or how to how to serve the food. Is that is it is it kind of specialized equipment or is it just kind of uh, updating equipment? It's not designed, I believe, to be specialized. Uh, it has to be um, CARES Act eligible, uh, but uh, includes things like like act capital assets. So we're talking about freezers and vehicles and equipment, things to make food basically or deliver food. Okay, but it is eligible under the, the funds, the, CR, the federal funds. Yeah, this, this makes, this conditions the use of these funds on being eligible. So the AOE could not use these funds uh, for th these purposes unless it was eligible. Okay, thank you. And to clarify, everything coming forward to us has been reviewed to be CRF eligible. This is not something our committee needs to, to worry about, correct? This has been addressed at, at a higher level. Uh, well, I'm not sure about that for this. This just came in from the AO, uh, AOE today. Uh, right. um, so I put this in, uh, but I did change it to say that it has to be CARES Act eligible. Okay. Um, yeah. okay. Anything else on that? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, section eight is um, amending, oh, don't go so far down, Phil. Uh, do go back up, please, to where you were. Right there. Thank you. Section, uh, scroll down to line seven, please. Good. Okay. So, section eight um, amends section 50 of the bill you passed um, with the appropriation of $50 million uh, for education purposes. So you have $50 million appropriated before, as you know. What this does is it adds an additional appropriation of $32 million to that earlier, earlier appropriation. So now we have $82 uh, million, million appropriated. Okay, that's the first thing it does. And then in line 17 and down the page, basically remember that this, this uh, appropriation is divided into four buckets, pre-K pre through 12, uh, HVAC, uh, independent schools, and kind of administration and technical uh, advice. 
Uh, so what this is saying here on line 17 is that if the amounts allocated to those four areas aren't used up uh, or aren't expected to be used up by the end of the year, then AOE is to redirect the funding to other other categories that have need, right? Related to related to, to education as opposed to the transportation. Yeah, just within those categories here, right? Those four categories I mentioned, okay? Um, and then the appropriation for efficiency Vermont on line five is increasing from 6.5 million to 11.5 million. Uh, the appropriation for pre-K through 12 is increasing from 41 million to 69 million. Um, and just a note on line 13, the appropriation for uh, approved independent schools is unchanged of up to 1.5 million. And on line 20, the appropriation for accounting and technical assistance is unchanged up to 1 million. Okay, those are the same. And then to conclude, um, section nine um, is um, just, just updating another section you passed, uh, which is A51, which was the uh, amount for, for efficiency Vermont. Uh, there's a whole section on how that was gonna work, uh, which cross-references the 6.5 billion that we just increased to 11.5. So this section has to be updated too, to reflect the increased appropriation. And that is it. So what this does is it uh, provides language, our recommended language that appropriations will re would review, um, ultimately change as needed as, as more information comes in. We know that I think September 10th is a date where there should be more information coming in. But it basically looks at what has been appropriated and what else is needed and making sure that if uh, an area does not use those funds that it can go back into the pool for other uses. Is that correct? Okay. All right, everybody, clear, clear as day here, right? Everybody totally understands this, right? <laughs> Any questions on these? I need to get my hand up quickly. I, I, I just a quick question, um, uh, probably for the secretary. Uh, um, do you know what the approved independent school one point five million dollar what the um, sort of, uh, requests are from that at this point? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I think Brad had said that there was a, a number of applications, but he didn't mention an amount that they were applying for. Yeah, we can we can take a look at that. Um, might have an answer during this meeting, but I'm not sure we have a firm figure on that. Okay. And we Thank came you. to that number by doing a, a little math calculation of cost per per uh, uh, you know publicly funded student. Yeah, so um, actually that does regulate it. You're right. Yeah, it it does, but I don't know if it caps it at 1.5. Does this language cap it at 1.5? Up to 1.5. Okay, I imagine that someone's going to take a look at that um, going forward as it goes goes through. Thanks. Anybody else? I think JFO or if Mark if Chloe's on the line, she had a question on some of the figures here. Okay, Chloe, Chloe yeah. Oh, yes, and then Kathleen and Casey. Sorry, Chloe. Um, I'm, uh, Jim, we can discuss offline. Okay, okay, yep. Um, uh, Kathleen James. Thanks, yeah, I had been um, emailing a little bit with Secretary French, so he probably knows what I'm gonna ask. I had just checked in briefly with um, Southwest Tech um, in Bennington, and I know I'm not an expert on how the different tech centers are organized, but I just wanna make sure that the necessary funds will be available to the tech centers. I know that they're organized in different ways. Secretary French. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, Representative James and I were going back and forth. I and I don't see the, the language I think is in the miscellaneous bill that you were gonna to speak to. Uh, we'll but get just to, to point out. 
Yeah, yeah, that's why I think it's it's not here yet. Um, but in terms of, I think what you were intending, this this amount that's on the screen, mm -hmm. uh, the approved independent school amount of one point five million. I think you are uh, contemplating uh, expanding the use of those funds to include the three tech centers that also are school districts. Right. Um, Casey, too. Yeah, thank you. Um, can I bring up something about section four? I we didn't really go over it with Jim, but. Um, section four, we're gonna get to that. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, we're just finishing those those two sections, then we'll go back and start with section one again. All right, thank you. Any other questions here on this? It's moving fast. <laughs> um, okay. Why don't we, anything from um, superintendents or school boards or teachers? Hi, uh, <clears throat> Chair Webb, this is Jeff Francis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jay Nichols, Jay Nichols of the VPA, Sue Sadlowski of VSBA and I met this morning to discuss the bill in its entirety. So mm -hmm. are, you, are you now going back to section one or are you looking for comments on the sections you just discussed? Just the, just those two sections first. Okay, no, no, um, I haven't conferred with them on that, but I'm okay. I'm I for VSA, I'm fine with that. Okay. Um, and Thank I think you for principles, Kate. We're all set with the the additions. Okay, and I think we have. Um, do I have Jeff Bannon in here? I don't think so. So you all feel that this is something you can work with then going forward, supporting it at this point. <laughs> okay, um, let's go back to the top then and start with section one. This is our miscellaneous ed bill, um, which probably isn't gonna pass as a bill, but be language sent up to appropriations to include in their bill. Okay, so should I walk through? Uh, yes, let's start. Let's start with one section one. In section one on line nine just uh, decreases the number of required school days from one seventy five to one seventy. I want to do them section by section. So, um, Secretary French, does this meet the need that you're talking about? <clears throat> The um, regional Texas defined shall be considered a school district. I think this is too broad. Um, I think the way I, I see this. I'm just doing section one first, which is the 170 days. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah as I mentioned ye yesterday, I, our, our thinking was that it would be um, reducing the number of student days and adding to uh, the number of in-service days. Um, you know, once again, all, all four of the issues that we brought forward are ones that were expressed by um, administrators around the state. And one of the common themes was a, a desire to have additional in-service days available. And I think it's a, <clears throat> just mechanically, it's important just to underscore that these, uh, this language really just addresses the minimums that are in the law. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to, hard to predict how this would actually be, be acted out uh, in the state, I suppose. Uh, for those districts that had master agreements that only referenced the minimum number of days, uh, there might be some change. Uh, but I was thinking about this, uh, how, how you have it worded now, where you're lowering uh, the number of student days, the minimum number of student days. Um, <clears throat> teachers are contracted to work in X number of days. Uh, if the law were to change to describe a new minimum, I'm not sure it would necessarily uh, and be enacted because uh, districts, you know, if they're say you're already contracting with teachers to work 175 days, and, so, and that that's the express language in their uh, master agreement as well as their individual employment contracts, which are already signed and put to bed. If you lower the number of days, I'm not sure to what extent a district would actually go back and or reopen their master agreement uh, or uh, then seek to redo all their employment contracts, which have to be done in triplicate. So. I think there was a general, clear to me. I think there was a general understanding that this would simply mean that um, of your 180 days, um, instead of having five in-service days, 
you're going to have 10 in service days and 170 students. Is that what we're trying to get to here? That was my suggestion to change those minimums, but I only see half of that here. This only speaks to the student days, not the in service days. Um, Peter Conlin and, and then Jeff Francis. Uh, Peter, do you, do you want to go to Jeff first? Or? Yes, you want to go ahead to Jeff yeah. first. Yes, Jeff. I think what I said was the intention that we're looking for, and I'm not sure what the language is to get. <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I would like to defer to Sue Siglowski. We talked about this specifically this morning. She actually uh, made some inquiries of some of the um, attorneys that work on collective bargaining agreements with school districts. So I'm hoping Sue will um, pass on the information we discussed this morning. Sue, are you available to talk about that today? Yes, I'm, I'm here and can talk about that. Yeah. So um, I, I actually have spoken to some attorneys who um, work with school boards on um, collective bargaining. And um, what, what, what their um, take on it is, is that mandating more in-service days will not eliminate that issue from local bargaining. And that, um, that we support the language as it is written here without the additional um, language that's being requested by the secretary. Um, for districts that are below 10 days now, if you mandate uh, 10 days of in-service, um, the estimate is that the cost of teacher salaries could increase by at least 1% on a statewide basis. Um, so we are in favor of leaving this to the local school district and not um, mandating in statute. Okay. Um, Peter Cousin? I kind of have a more general question that maybe Jeff Fannin is the best person to answer, and that is just sort of how do I, this is a, a complex issue, members of the public sort of say to me, if kids start late, why can't they just go late? And I'm sure there's a, a simple way to explain why we are reducing the number of days kids need to be in school. Well, um... I'll say this. I think that, first of all, like Sue, I, we support this language as drafted. Uh, I'll say it simply that way. Um, and, you know, what, we're, what you're talking about is adding days in June. And I don't know, you know, I think for us to begin to understand what's going to happen in June of 2021 now, uh, I think is, is really speculative. And, and I don't, I don't want to try to do it. Um, there's a lot between now and then, and I think that, I think this gives the schools and staff the flexibility they need, which is, you know, just reducing the, the 175 to the 170, given all, you know, the governor delayed the start right there. You know, those were some days, and uh, I think this makes sense. So school boards and teachers agree on this language as written. That works for me. <laughs> Yeah, I was just looking for a, an easy public way to say when somebody says, well, if the kids start late, why can't they go late? Why are you shaving the number of days kids are in school down? Well, you know, yeah. I think, you know, my thought is we're going to have to figure this out come cold and flu season anyway, if not sooner. So I think uh, we'll see what happens come, say, November. Uh, what really, uh, what we're going to want to do in June. Like and we can change this in January. So we can take this up in January if we need to, but this just gives some comfort, uh, I think, to just... Just something about the magic of the numbers 180, 175, and 170 that is a little challenging to the public. Yeah. Yeah, I was, if I could, Madam Chair, I was, I agree. I think that's why, you know, we were looking for the, keeping the 180 whole and to the point about we don't know how the year will end. I mean, that's precisely uh, why the waiver language is there. Um, and this language uh, mentions that. So we do have the ability, we used it last spring uh, to adjust the calendar based on the second half of the year as events unfold. And that's, that's authority that the state board has. And the state board gave that to me more broadly last spring to enact the waiver as necessary. Okay, section two.
This is where we added in the uh, independent um, tech centers into, go ahead, Jim, why don't you do it? Yeah, to, to say exactly as you're saying, Joe Webb, this is basically, um, we passed uh, the appropriation uh, earlier this year for K, pre-K through 12, we used the term school district, but for some reason in top 16, school district is defined to include lots of types of school districts, but for some reason, not these um, career uh, technical centers, which are independent, the three that we have in the state. What this does is it says those tech centers, um, which are independent will be uh, considered to be school districts for this purpose. So there would be the funding there, the $41 million now increased uh, would be available to them uh, as well. If you go with the change in section eight, I would actually take out section two and just put it right into section eight. Uh, just just define it there. But okay, that's a question of form, not substance. So yeah. And then there's just a little bit of a worry that we've factored it by um, per pupil, but we've capped it, and we're now adding these sections as well. So there's some concern there. Okay. Madam Chair, could I, yeah. the, if we could go back, to, I uh, want to express concern that I think as worded, it's it's much more uh, general than what your intention is. Um, a regional tech center as defined um, shall be considered district. That includes all, of, I read that to include all of our tech centers, not just the three that are school districts. And the issue is they're not independent per se, they are school districts. There's three of them that are school districts on their own right. So the other tech centers are covered uh, under the LEA, the CRF LEA, because they're part of an LEA, they're part of a school district. These three are not LEAs uh, for, for the purposes of CRF. So we're trying to address their needs. I think as worded now, you're, you're including all of them, not the three. And then secondly, maybe it's to Jim's point about form versus substance, uh, the reference to section A50C, I think you also need to be more specific there to go to uh, C.2 uh, under the previous organization, which is the 1.5 million for independent schools. I think it's as worded now, it's very general and it could refer to all of the CRF funding, including uh, the LEA uh, funding that you just are proposing to increase. And I would, I'd lastly, I just say that, um, you know, I appreciate the need and that's a need that we have or a priority we have as well to address their needs. We do think their needs will be addressed through uh, the gear uh, appropriation, which is $4.4 .4 million. Um, so I would encourage you to maybe think twice about doing this because I think it's going to get very complex if you're not careful. And I, I do think the needs are going to be met uh, adequately through gear. Okay, that was the question that we had earlier. So it, it is likely that these centers can be addressed without using these CRF funds, but actually using the governor's funds. So it's- Yeah, it's the governor's been very clear. He intends to focus those funds on the needs of CT centers. So it's possible that we could remove it and they would still be funded. Uh, just to clarify, um, yeah. we don't necessarily need to single out then the three independently governed Technical centers. And would section two be helpful? But would be would it be good to keep if we said a regional technical center or I'm sorry, an independently governed regional technical center? Or is are you feeling like that's unnecessary at this point? If if you firstly, I would say I think it's unnecessary. I think gear is going to cover it, so I uh, recommend right. that you could eliminate this and address the need if you were and still inclined to include it. I think you want to be very careful about defining this, and I would I'd recommend actually including the three of them by name: um, SPSU, the CDC, um, Hannaford, and Springfield. Jim. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to say the the um, the cross reference here is to 16 BSA 1571, which is the one, the section that creates these independent critical centers. So I don't think that reference is broad. I think it's narrow. I think it's targeting just the three. Um, I'm happy to talk to uh, Secretary French about that further. Um, the other thing that Secretary French mentioned is, is capturing this under uh, the appropriation for independent schools and the intent of the current language 
is to capture them under pre-K through 12, which is a $41 billion appropriation, not the 1.5. So it depends what you want to do, obviously. The way it's drafted now, my intent at least, is for just the three independent schools that are tech centers and covering them under the K through 12 appropriation of 41 million. That's the intent here. Um, yeah. Obviously, there might be a done in a policy direction. Okay, okay, that makes some sense. And again, this is going to another committee. <laughs> um, so, so we can make this as a recommendation and, and there'll be plenty of time for people to, to, to um, review going forward. But you're saying that this language does identify specifically the independents. Uh, it doesn't name them by name, but it's the section that creates the independents. Uh, school districts that this refers to. Okay, we've got um, 12 more minutes till we need to be on the floor. Um, section three is the ADM question that I'm just gonna avoid for now because we're gonna take that up on Friday with uh, uh, Ways and Means. Um, then the Australian uh, ballot language, which, uh, Secretary French and Sue Saglowski on that? Yeah, I, uh, I think I spoke to this yesterday. I think uh, this language is satisfactory to address uh, what we had identified as a concern. Okay, I just realized, Casey Toop, I'm sorry, I missed you. Well, we can listen to um, Sue and uh, the, I, I would defer to her right now. Okay, Sue Saglowski. Thank you. Just a short statement that VSBA supports section four as written. Thanks. Thank you. Um, can yes. I ask now? Um, my only concern with this is I know money's tight. I would be um, happy to talk to, I know time's tight. I'd be happy to talk to um, Secretary uh, of State Condos, see what he has for money for this, because I would love to see some funding behind this. And I personally don't like that. It's just um, you can apply for it or whatever. Um, I I would I would like to see this be an initiative. Uh, not much. I don't I don't believe much is going to change between now and March. And I think this is something that you know if we look at town meeting day, getting 150 people into a small gym into a small community could um, if we don't have anything uh, figured out by then with this coronavirus COVID 19. Um, could be really hard for um, small communities. Um, so I would be in favor of actually pushing this more where we could put money behind it. I know we don't have a say in it, but that's just something that I would um, be behind. Thank you, Jeff Fannin. Yes, uh, Representative Tooth, I, I, I agree. And and I think that uh, uh, we're, we're, there's not gonna be much changes from November to town meeting day. We're, in November, we're mailing out everybody a, bail, a ballot and I think we ought to do the same here. And, and I don't know if it's a, uh, I think it's probably, you're right, Representative Tooth, it's probably the Secretary of State's office that ought to be doing this, but we think it makes infinite sense to do every, uh, universal vote by mail as we're doing in the fall here. Uh, so I, I I think that's what we ought to do. I, I, I know uh, Representative Gian Batista spoke about this in May in Essex, and I think it's a, it, you know, it makes infinite sense. So we, we would support that as uh, going forward. Okay, um, then we have uh, section five, which is the waiver of online teaching endorsement, Secretary French. So uh, this issue um, in particularly uh, addresses the uh, number of virtual academies that school districts have created um, in a response to the uh, pandemic and the uh, standards board uh, has been navigating this issue uh, to a certain extent, and they've uh, provided a waiver of the online teaching endorsement initially in the spring, and then extended that through December. Um, a number of school districts have come forward and said it would be really good to understand uh, that waiver availability through the rest of the year, firstly. Then secondly, um, the standards board has not expressed as much interest in providing a waiver for those teachers that teach in the virtual academies um, my understanding is they believe those teachers should be required to have the online endorsement, which is going to be very impractical considering it takes several months to obtain that endorsement and uh, very well could lead to 
lead to a significant bottleneck come uh, second semester if we don't address this issue now. So I'm noticing that there's, you meant this to be just for this current school year, because at the moment it's 2021 to 22, and you're just, you actually just mean through, through this current school year. That's correct. Okay, so we can, we can fix that. The questions on that um, and the elections of the unified, this is the, the ongoing thing. We do this every year while we're, <laughs> why do we do this every year, Dylan? <laughs> this affects your district. Do you, do you want the explanation? Yeah, the, the, the one that you can do in one minute. Yeah, essentially uh, we had to pass this after the enactment of Act 46 because some of the language in chapter 11 of Title 16 was recycled um, from uh, the union school districts. And so in practice, it created issues <clears throat> both uh, with appointment of members um, after their terms had expired, but then additionally, how the municipality would consult with the school board. Um, and so this was one that we put into session law. It's sunset on July 1st. Uh, my hope is we can extend the sunset because the goal of the agency working in consultation with Ledge Council and me at the time was to actually work on a redraft of this section and Last I knew, um, Donna Russo-Savage at the agency was working on that and was willing to in the future. I don't want to speak for them, um, but this would be a stopgap measure and some other set of legislators will need to address it permanently to ensure this part of law functions properly. Okay, and probably next year when we do chapter 11, if we get to do that. Okay, so it's now we've got uh, five minutes to floor. Um, and what I'd, I'd like to do, can uh, get rid of the screen sharing for a minute um, we are going to meet tomorrow, but I need to get, I need to get a, a sense of, of if, if we can live with the CRF funding as it was, as we know, at this point in time, the way it was outlined by um, JFO. And let's try some blue hands. Okay, so everybody get ready. Um, I'm looking for support for the allocation of CRF funds as noted on the, um, the document from JFO. And if you can support that, will you raise your hands? Okay. One, two. Okay, hands down. And those against. Okay, so I'm seeing some people are voting twice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, those, vote, those against. You can only vote yes or no. You can't vote yes and no, sorry, it's binary. So those against. Okay, I am going to um, let the appropriations committee that, that we would support that use of CRF funds. I know that we have to do more with the language, um, which I, I, we're just out of time to, to deal with the language. Um, and we'll be meeting tomorrow. And if I could, I could get folks back so that we can work on the language of our bill, but I at least have the numbers for them. Uh, Sarita. Just what time are we meeting tomorrow, Kate? Do you know? Uh, what time is it, Phil? Is it 1030? Tomorrow is 1230 to 2. 1230, OK. Um, and we'll figure out um, how that's going to work. <laughs> um, yes, I've got, Thank you. yeah, that would be great. We're going to look at some higher ed uses for CRF funds tomorrow, and we'll follow up with this as well. Um, I appreciate the committee's um, flexibility in, in this, and um, Jim and uh, Secretary French, there are a couple of issues that you folks are talking about. Um, Casey and Jeff Fannin, I'm not sure what to do here. This is a little bit out of 
out of my world in terms of addressing this with the Secretary of State um, and funding for that. Um, it's also possible that there's gonna be more coming in relation to voting, I'm not sure. Um, Casey? Yeah, I, and I mean, if it's something that we just put in the in their ear now and it's something we can deal, the, the next legislative body can, and can take care of, but I think it's something that we should really focus on because I don't think this is going away in the next six months. So I think you're I know, it's, important to, it's important to remember that um, we vote on a lot of other things besides uh, school budgets on town meeting day. So it goes beyond the education committee this issue for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But this at least puts it puts that on the list. It'll go up to appropriations and then it'll start on its journey. You know, as it stands, though, I mean, the, the bill talks about Australian ballot uh, on town meeting day. And I think that makes sense. I, most of the schools are doing it already, frankly, yeah, given Act 46. But the, the larger question is the bigger question that Secretary Condos may want to weigh in on, I'm sure. OK, I think what I'll just do is include this language for now and can certainly flag. Um, Casey, I'd encourage you as well to flag, maybe flag your leadership on that as an issue. Um, certainly happy to have someone in the, on the Democrat side to flag it for, for leadership. Um, and I, we've got two minutes, so I, I just think we're gonna have to stop. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate the work that, that you've done today. Um, did not actually get to you on the, I'm sorry, I just remembered, I did not say anything about the um, outright. <laughs> Are you okay if I just tell them a range of three to 8%? Can we deal with that? <laughs> well, they're gonna make up their mind anyhow. <laughs> they're gonna make up their mind anyway, right. I just figure we're the ones that are representing education and they're going to represent taking money away, not giving it back. <laughs> True. <laughs> okay. See you on the floor. Thank you, everybody.